All right, so we've got the Thermidorian reaction today, and we're going to get into Napoleon. Um, that means that we've now moved on to another phase of the revolution, which is called the Thermidorian reaction phase. Uh, we've just gotten out of the radical phase, which was sometimes called the national convention phase. Um, and the Jacobins had pretty much jumped the shark in terms of being psychotic and violent. And it was almost like the country sort of had a collective WTF moment and said, we need to fix this um, because... We had murdered tens of thousands of our own citizens, and it even gotten to a point where the Jacobins uh, were murdering the people that were responsible for the French Revolution. All right, it would be like George Washington and Madison and Jefferson and Franklin all sitting around just shooting each other. All right, it just it got preposterous, and France started to feel very dirty uh, about what was taking place in their country. So this is a reactionary phase. This is obviously a reaction uh, to what's just occurred. All right, so structurally, that means new government, shocker, they are now on their third constitution uh, in 1795. They refer to it as the constitution of year three. All right, in order to avoid another Robespierre, they go hard in the other direction. Robespierre represents power concentrated in one individual's hands, so they want to make sure that power is going to be distributed evenly across a whole bunch of different areas. They create a two-house legislature, one called the Council of Elders, one called the Council of 500. All right, so way more representatives than normally are represented. And then instead of having a one-person executive, they had a five-person executive, and that becomes known as the Directory. Does everybody understand why they would do that? Okay. As long as there is one person in charge, he may have the power of becoming a tyrant. All right. And that's what ultimately happened with Robespierre. And then people lost their minds. First thing they did was they repealed the law of 22 or 22 Prioriale. Remember that one from yesterday? They literally got into a stage where they said that a revolutionary tribunal can convict people of crimes without hearing any evidence. It's like that's the most obscene thing, you know, in a country that supposedly was built on a foundation of things like individual liberties, like freedom of speech, press, assembly, etc., but also abolishing torture, abolishing the idea that you could uh, stand trial without a jury or be able to face your executioners or face your accusers. Like all the things that we kind of value uh, in legal protections are now gone. And you could just whimsically have somebody killed. Okay, Naturally, if you think about it, like after something like this, the Jacobins, it would be almost like, think about like how people would, would have responded to Nazis after World War II was over. Okay? I mean, you got things like the Nuremberg trials, but you also have people that like, are even of the opinion that somebody was sympathizing with the Nazis during the war and could probably expect reprisals. And that's kind of what happens. Now, think of about the people that were attacked the most during the excessive phases of the French Revolution. Who were they? Aristocrats. Aristocrats. Okay? Most of the aristocrats, or at least a good chunk of aristocrats, died during the revolution, usually at the hands of the reign of terror or the Jacobins. All right. So now whatever is left of those aristocrats, all right, are now looking for payback. All right. And you had people that were coming back from wherever they were during the worst parts of the revolution are now coming back out of hiding, but now they're angry. They're like, we lost loved ones. We lost our estates. We lost our livelihoods. We lost our privileges. We lost our, our offices. We lost our dignities. All right? And so you had these little pockets of people that had you know, some ties to aristocracy that are running around the countryside looking for any Jacobins that they could find. It's almost like, remember the September massacres when the San Calat kind of went nuts thinking that everybody that might be an aristocrat is some kind of revolutionary or counter-revolutionary? Now they're doing that again. All right. Except the role is reversed. Aristocrats are now looking at any Jacobins that they could find anywhere. 
and they're going to attack them. Okay? There's actually a group called the Bands of Jesus, if you read about them. Okay? They dragged suspected terrorists from prisons and murdered them as alleged royalists had been murdered during the September massacres in 1792. Just to kill them, you know, because it's not good enough to let them just sit in jail. All right? Um, so there's that going on. You're going to expect a whole group of people that identify themselves as monarchists that are going to want their privileges back, their property back, their positions in politics back, and they're going to want to make sure that anybody that was part of the excesses of the reign of terror is punished. Okay? And they did things like, you know, they outlawed the Jacobin Club, like all the things they would have done with the Nazis. Like, we don't want to see the symbol anymore. We don't want to see people, like, doing the salutes anymore or whatever that stuff is. We want any trace of Nazism wiped off the map. And they were trying to do that with the Jacobins as well. Okay? It was such a dirty, dirty time that they're trying to go back. But you have a government that is structurally going to be ineffectual. Okay? You don't have anybody that can say, this is what we're going to do. Because you had five executives and like 500 plus legislators that have a whole bunch of different ideas about what should be done. What they didn't want was Jacobin terror. That's the one thing that they could agree upon. All right. Other things that happened. Um, these are just like little kind of symbolic rebellions against the worst excesses of the reign of terror. Remember when they went after, like, you can't wear powdered wigs, you can't wear stockings, you know, we're not going to allow, like, aristocratic plays or things like that. We're not going to allow religious festivals. We're not going to allow churches to be able to celebrate holidays like Christmas. There's people that are going to be like, look at this, Christmas tree, lights, all right? Hey, look at this, a rosary. Hail Mary, how about that? What are you going to do now? And Because they, they were so upset that they couldn't even worship and couldn't like do the traditions that they had always done because the reign of terror wanted to create this republic of virtue that would whitewash all of this stuff. And now they're coming back and they're like, no, I mean, you don't like prostitutes? Well, we're going to have ten times the prostitutes. You don't like plays? We're going to be performing plays 24-7. All right, Catholic services are back up and running again. All right, there's a lot of anger right now, and the question is, is the directory going to be able to deal with it? All right, it says problems from the left and problems from the right. I have basically explained the problems from the right, but they're going to get bigger because monarchist forces are literally trying to take over um, this new government and then start passing pro monarchist policies. And the fear is that at least the moderate phase of the revolution, that's exactly what the directory wants to get back. They want to like get back into that honey spot that was like 1789 to 91. All right, where they had a night of August the 4th, private property was protected, all of those things. But they also wanted laissez-faire economics, which again is going to antagonize the working class. All right. The monarchists want to push it back prior to 1789. Okay? And then you have these left-wingers that were like, there were some gains that we made during the radical phase of the revolution that were good, like price controls. Okay? Like controlling inflation. Like wage increases. Like low bread prices. We need some of that stuff. Okay, the peasants are now nervous. You know, what's going to happen with land reforms? Nobody really knows what's going to happen with this reactionary thing. And the directory doesn't even really know. And we haven't really even finished the war. I told you that the majority of the war was over in 1795, but Austria and Britain are continuing to fight. Okay, so the war is still going on. A symbol of the royalist rising up against the convention, and it happens in a couple of instances, but one of them is called the 13 Vendemiere Uprising, which everybody knows to be October 5th, because you had this mental chart that can convert the old calendar into the crazy French calendar. So, obviously, October 5th is 13 Vendemiere. All right. But the royalists rose up against the convention, and the convention was nervous that the royalists were going to have some kind of right-wing coup d'etat where they would gain control of the country. And the directory 
called in the army. And guess who came on behalf of the army? Napoleon Bonaparte. And he disbanded the royalist plot with a whiff of grape shot, which means he fired some cannons at them. Okay, That's the first time they've called in Napoleon. Two years later, when they're going to have votes, and the royalists, rather than having a coup d'etat, said, we're just going to get a whole bunch of pro-royalists to vote for royalists and then take over the assembly seats. Then the directory said, now we need a coup d'etat to make sure that the royalists can't legitimately take over the government. They called the army again in and Napoleon to say, make sure you support this coup d'etat. So now, on every occasion where they need Napoleon and the army to step in on their behalf, Napoleon comes in and steps in on their behalf. But it shows a weakness, and it also shows an over-reliance on the army to be able to make them popular. And maybe they're not all that popular. Okay, Because the right isn't happy, because they haven't done enough for them, and then the left is going to be unhappy because they're moving back to middle class, that middle class slot, but it excludes them from the things they need, like low bread prices and jobs and stuff like that. Okay, Does everybody kind of see what's going on as far as that's concerned? Okay, So that's sort of how it plays. By the end of it, the left-wing uprising is led by this guy named Francois Noel Gracias Babeuf. And when the socialists form in the, in the 1830s and 40s in France, that's going to be one of their poster childs. Because he was like socialist before it was cool to be socialist. And his uprising was called the Conspiracy of Equals, and he was calling for the equalization of property among all the people. All right? And he was eventually tried, executed, martyred. And like I said, in the eight, the working class is going to have uprisings right after Napoleon in 1830, in 1848, uh, in 1870, uh, and then throughout the 1880s and 90s. And Babeuf will always be there. Okay, it's kind of a symbol to say, you know, there's a guy that died uh, for the causes of the working class. The Directory lacked any real political base, relied on the army to maintain its power and quell uprisings. It means they are leaning on Napoleon and cloaking themselves in his popularity. So now we're going to go to another set of notes that are in your uh, chapter um, called, let me see if I got this, Lecture Notes Napoleon. All right, we're going to kind of get into at least that story. All right, so this is what Lecture Notes Napoleon looks like. All right, so when Napoleon meets the directory, here's how Napoleon is kind of played out. This is Napoleon in his 20s, all right, that he is the defender of the republic, not only at home, but also abroad. He's a defender of the republic at home because every time the directory has brought him in to try to defend their republic, he has showed up. But also abroad, when he's fighting, that's where he's making his money. He's a military commander. Maybe the best military commander in Western history outside of Alexander the Great. All right, And in those years of the revolution, when the, when the French have been at war with the likes of the Austrias and the Prussias and the Britons, etc., etc., Napoleon's front and center on a lot of that stuff. And where he really earns his reputation is at this moment when the directory is really weak and is trying to gain its traction as the leaders of France after the Jacobin terror. Napoleon is over in Italy right now. Okay? And eventually, I'll, I'll get to that story in just a second, but Napoleon is, is, is bossing out pretty hard. Uh, in his fights against the Austrians. And the battlefield is basically in places like Venice and Sardinia and the territories that Austria had under its possession. Uh, he believes that because of its proximity um, to the, you know, the Mediterranean and its proximity to France, Austria is able to concentrate a lot of force there and fight against France. So he feels like if we can take them out in these kind of sweet spots here, uh, we'll be able to take Austria out of the war. Because okay, otherwise, Austria is kind of like mountain locked in all of their other spots. All right. Okay, let's look at the background a little bit. Napoleon is born in Corsica in 1796. Does anybody, I don't know if I have a map of Corsica. I probably do. 
Yeah, let's see if we can find it real quick. Uh, no, it wouldn't be in there. We see a map. Mm, no. All right. Anyway, yeah, it's like a little island, and it's off like the southern coast of France. It's really close to France, but it's not in France. And prior to 1768, it wasn't under French's control. And so that's a unique little tidbit, is that Napoleon was born in Corsica in 1769. Corsica was annexed by the French in 1768. Why is that important? He's French. A year later, a year earlier, whatever the case is, he's not French. Because he's French and because these, like Corsica just circumstantially had become part of France in 1768, he's born and then gets the benefits of being French, which means he can attend French schools and he can get French military training. All right? And he's obviously pretty talented, okay? Like a savant, like just, you know, to the point where... I mean, the guy was a brigadier general by the time he was like 24 years old. All right? But that doesn't happen if the French Revolution doesn't happen either. Because that's the other benefit. He lucked out by the fact that, freak luck, France has annexed Corsica. He's born in Corsica, which means he's French based on the annexation. But then as he's rising up and attending school and hitting his teenage years and eventually to a place where he can graduate and then succeed as a military, as, as, as a soldier, then at the point where he's going to go from being non-commissioned to commission, the ceiling has lifted that allows him to become an officer. When does that happen? Do you guys remember? The night of... The night of August the 4th. And I read a something to you that was very specific out of that. They basically gave Napoleon his abilities. And that was that, in that document that I read you. But it said, All citizens without distinction of birth are eligible to any office or dignity, whether ecclesiastical, civil, or military. If Napoleon was not born noble, Okay? And that means he would have hit his ceiling and he would have petered out because only p people of aristocratic privilege have the chance to become officers in the French army. And right at the point where he was about ready to advance and would have hit that ceiling, they lifted the ceiling. All right? So night of August 4th, 1789, codified in 1791, he then has the ability to advance to become an officer and start ruling or run, you know, uh, conducting operations. And then he starts conducting operations. Okay? And so it's just little questions like, what if he was born two years earlier? We may never have even heard of him. All right? What if the revolution doesn't happen exactly at this moment? We may not have ever heard of him. Okay? That's, that's, I mean, that's the part where does the person make the circumstances or does the circumstances make the person? I mean, Napoleon is one of those, I forget, but they call them like world historical individuals. And there's only been a handful of them in history where you could literally say that the world that existed prior to this person's presence is different than the world that exists after his presence. And Napoleon was one of those people. Okay, and I'll explain why as we get through the next couple of days. Right. Okay, so what is he up to? When the Jacobin terror comes to a close and the directory is creating a new constitution and trying to get governing, um, he is controlling the French armies in Italy. Okay. They had gotten out of a war with Prussia and Spain, so they were only at war with Britain and Austria. And the only reason that that was the case was because they had annexed Belgium, which was the Austrian Netherlands. Right? Britain isn't concerned because they're in Belgium, which is close to the Netherlands, which then puts them potentially in some kind of spot where Britain would be concerned about that. Geographic proximity or whatever else. Austria, naturally... Uh, wants control over its own territories. So they're going to be at war with France. That's where he gets to play. 
All right, he can't fight Britain and Austria at the same time. He's the director or the commander of the armies in Italy. And he starts winning victory after victory after a victory between 1795 and 1797. And it gets to a point where one of the bossest things ever, he's defeated the Austrians in battle to such a degree that he extends out a truce and then ends up signing a treaty that gets Austria out of the war and gets Italy to annex, or I'm sorry, France to annex all of their territories in Italy. All right. And he does it all on his own. All right, there's no directory representatives or whatever. He just thought it up and he did it. It's called the Treaty of Campo Formio. Yes? Why would you want to annex France's territory? No, they annexed Austria's territories in Italy. So France basically has control over a bunch of territories that existed in Italy. All right, like Venice and like Sardinia. All right, those are now under France's control, at least for Napoleon. All right, the majority of the Italian peninsula is now French territory, and he was able to negotiate that and to negotiate Austria's exit from the war. So the only people he had to worry about fighting now were Britain. Britain is his Achilles heel. All right. But he was looking at it, and he's like, all right, so Britain's fighting us. I've taken care of Austria. We're kind of in this limbo right now. How do I deal with Britain? And he devises a plan that says, we can't invade Britain proper yet. We don't have the capacity to do it. So we're going to try to suck their lifeline from the eastern Mediterranean. Okay? So he looks at Egypt and the idea of where Egypt is in proximity to the trade routes that come from uh, Britain controlling the Indian trade and Britain kind of controlling the sea lanes in the eastern Mediterranean and says there's a lot of goods that come between that area. If we can cement ourselves in Egypt, we might be able to disrupt those routes, cut Britain off from some of its lifelines, and then, then we can go after Britain. So Napoleon launches a campaign in Egypt. There's a couple of campaigns in Egypt. All right. The first one was successful. It's called the Battle of the Pyramids in 1798. The French were able to defeat this mercenary army called the Mamelukes. And now the French armies are kind of embedded uh, territorially in Egypt. All right. They also discovered the Rosetta Stone, and there was some other cool stuff that happened while that was going on. But the French, you know, hanging out at the pyramids, et cetera, et cetera. And then Britain's like, oh, that's what Napoleon is up to. And they bring their fleet down. And they park that fleet off the coast of Egypt, off the coast of Alexandria. And Napoleon, he can fight his you-know-what off on the land. But Britain controls the seas. And when Britain's fleet engages with France's fleet, Horatio Nelson is the leader. And if anybody's been to Britain, you know that there's a handful of people that have more statues than anybody else. Okay? Britain was able to defeat a couple of world historical figures. One of them was Napoleon, the other was Hitler. And most of the statues are related to people that did that. All right? But you will see more Duke of Wellington statues, and you will see more Horatio Nelson statues... Uh, than probably anybody else in Britain. And the reason why is Horatio Nelson uh, was a solid 2-0 and against Napoleon. All right. And this Battle of the Nile, the British were able to rout the French fleet and then ultimately uh, left a whole bunch of French troops stranded in Egypt, including Napoleon. All right. Cut the French supply lines off. The French army is stranded. Napoleon ends up leaving his own army and goes back to France. And you're like, this is an L for Napoleon. After one of his greatest victories, he now has one of his greatest L's. All right? He spins it into one of the greatest victories. Okay? And the reason why is if you look down... Because everything that he was doing in Italy, he had started to build like a little bit of political power. It's almost exactly like what Julius Caesar did. Julius Caesar is earning his victories in Gaul, France, and then he's writing commentaries on the Gallic Wars, and now everybody at least understands what his reputation is as a military commander. Now, Napoleon's not writing, you know, like commentaries on like kicking the crap out of the Austrians in Italy, 
but he has his wife Josephine, and Josephine has the ear of a lot of the highest ranking people in the French government. Like, this is what Napoleon's doing. This is what, you know, this is the battle he just won. He wants to let you know that our French troops are doing X, Y, and Z. Okay? And he's also gotten a reputation among some other really important people. Like, one of them is Abbe Joseph Emmanuel Siez. You remember that name? The guy that wrote What is the Third Estate? He becomes a big Napoleon guy. And then he's got his brother. Okay? And Napoleon, with the help of some of his friends, are able to spin that the French were not routed off the Abu Kir, off the coast of Alexandria by the British fleet because of Napoleon's skills or lack of skills. It was because the directory was weak-willed and could not provide him the supplies he needed to do the job. And they already hated the Directory anyway. You had left-wing uprisings, you had right-wing uprisings, and the Directory is already weak and overly reliant on the army. But now Napoleon's going to flip the script. And so when he comes home, he still comes home as the hero that negotiated the peace treaty against Austria. All right, And if he lost, he was able to pin that on the Directory. And he's able to use all of that together to stage a coup d'etat where he takes control of the country. Right. And that happens in 1799. Okay? The legislature is chased out, the directory is disbanded, and guess what? We've moved into a next phase of the French Revolution with a new government and a new constitution. All right? So constitution number one, 1791. Constitution 1793, known as Constitution of the Year One. Constitution 1795, known as the Constitution of the Year Three. Constitution of 1799, known as the Constitution of Year 7, creates a republic-ish thing with Napoleon as an executive taking the role of first consul, which just so happens to be the same thing that Julius Caesar claimed himself to be when he returned from Gaul uh, and became the leader uh, in Rome. All right, and the question is, will he become a tyrant? Hmm. All right. Okay, so that's happening. Um, what also happened after his route in Egypt was that all of these other countries started to get back involved in their fight. It's almost like the Austrians jumped back in. The Ottomans jumped in because, you know, he had attacked Egypt. And then Portugal and Naples and a bunch of other places are involved. And now France is at war with all these other countries. And it's almost like Napoleon let it happen. Because he needed the directory to be so weak that and so unpopular that he would be able to take control of the government and then eventually he takes control of the government. And now the first thing that he's going to do is what he does best, which is defeat those countries. And so in the space of like a year and a half, he gains control of the country, through, creates a new constitution, declares himself first consul, and then starts defeating all of these other countries. Defeats the Austrians again, signs a new peace treaty, and then even signs a peace treaty with Britain, which would have been like him eating lima beans, but he did it. Okay? It's called the Peace of Amiens. All right. He needed this treaty, and he's going to say, like, all right, well, they handed me the most embarrassing L of my life. Am I going to allow them to do that? Or do I just need to concentrate on domestic policy, get the people 100% behind me, and then I'll go deal with Britain? And that's what he decides to do. So he's got out of war with everybody, all right? He's now gained control of the country, and now he's going to, like, shut all that out for a while, like the military commander stuff, and just be a domestic politician for the next couple of years. And in those years, a whole bunch of stuff happens, okay? One of his... Crowning achievements, unfortunately for women and working class people, not a great achievement, uh, is the Napoleonic Code. The Napoleonic Code provides really like all of the gains that were made during the bourgeois phase of the revolution, like the night of August the 4th stuff. All right. The idea that like equal opportunity for people based uh, entirely on them. 
All right, all of that stuff is there. Private property protected, yes, he's got that too. So it shows that he cares about the middle class and the things that middle class people care about. He doesn't allow for labor unions. He doesn't allow for strikes. But he will hook up the sans culotte or the working class, at least to some degree. Okay, The fact that he is respecting property ownership means that he's providing for the peasantry because the peasantry made those gains during the French Revolution and he confirms them. So when they like they took the land from the emigres and confiscated it and then gave it to the peasants, the peasants got to keep that land. All right, but for women, the Civil Code of 1804 basically made women the subjects of their husbands in a marriage. Okay, they literally became men's property. And so if there was concerns about divorce, women, what they got from divorce was different than what men got from divorce. Okay, Um, the women's ability to be able to acquire property after a divorce, forget about it. Okay, that wasn't going to happen. Okay, women basically, once they married or entered into a marriage contract, they had legally forfeited their own rights to their husband. Okay, and so... And unfortunately, there was like those kind of laws were kind of in and out, all right? And we also know that women's rights was a a, a big issue throughout the Enlightenment. And as we had gotten to the revolutionary period, it was not only like individual voices, but it was actual activists and organizations that were trying to pursue women's rights. Robespierre gave it a couple of, you know, like really kind of set fire to it and started to guillotine a lot of those leading women. Napoleon's code kind of finishes the job. And there's a lot of people that believe that Napoleon probably set women's rights back about 100 years. All right. By this civil code of 1804, if you read about it. Okay, some, uh, some good things that he did, like legitimately good things. Education reforms. All right, basically like a template for what 19th century education was going to be. But he created elementary schools, made them compulsory. Uh, He created technical schools. He created a University of France and that system. So what we have now is state-supported or mandated education, okay, and levels that went all the way through a university system. That is going to produce a literate, strong, prepared, skilled populace that will be able to take them through the next century. Okay, If there is a bad side, it's just that if you are controlling education, you also get to control the narrative, which means he can use it as a tool um, for propaganda or he can use it as a tool for, um, what's the term, ingratiation, doctrine, indoctrination. That's a better term. Good. Okay, another thing that he did was he found out what was not working about the previous five or six years and made it work. Like one of the things that was definitely not working was when Robespierre and the Reign of Terror carried out an attack against the Roman Catholic Church. It started earlier than them. It started with the civil constitution of the clergy and all of that stuff. But the de-Christianization and getting rid of like religious holidays and all of that stuff, um, that was a really, really bad one because the country was predominantly Catholic and Napoleon knew it. So the Concord of, out of 1801 made nice with the Roman Catholic Church, gave them the respect and recognition that they deserved and basically said, you know what, France is it's still a Catholic country. Even though I've got control over the church and I've got control over education, I still, I was able to work it out with the Pope and all of you Catholics now can go back to being Catholic again. All right. They were already doing that anyway during the directory phase, but now they're like doing it and they don't have to be fearful of it. Okay. It's a Catholic country. It's back to being a Catholic country. All right. This other stuff is just, um, you know, administration and providing really good, equitable, equitable and uniform um, administration. So he creates these different departments, prefects, sub-prefects. Um, the tax collection is going to be uniform. It's going to be collected. And better than that, it is equitably collected among all of the social classes. He creates a national bank, which is going to put them on a solid financial footing. 
for the Sang Kalat, even though he doesn't allow them to have labor unions or the ability to strike, he is giving them price controls, and he is giving them jobs through public works projects. For the peasants, he confirmed the gains that they had made in property ownership uh, during the, um, you know, the radical phase of the revolution. Okay? But as a, as a dictator, he's still a dictator. All right? He claims himself to be consul, but consuls don't generally have a secret police force. All right? This guy that's running the police force, his name was Joseph Fouché. He's like a Luca Brasi type. You know, they found out that he, he was killing a lot of people during the Reign of Terror. And Napoleon sits down with him. He's like, I've seen some of your work. You're good. Do you want a job? He's like, do I still get to kill people? And like, you know, that kind of thing. It's like, yeah. I mean, so if there are people that are speaking out against Napoleon, things are going to happen to them. All right. If they're having elections for Napoleon, those elections are basically like, 10 million people vote for Napoleon and 1,300 vote against Napoleon. Or there is no rival candidate. So if there is elections, they're not really elections. Okay. Um, universal suffrage, what does that mean? Everyone can vote. Well, not women. Oh, all men. But all men can vote. But all men can vote for Napoleon. So you can say, well, yeah, there's universal suffrage, but you're just voting for Napoleon. The old feudal world is destroyed, though, and it's not coming back, and that's, that's the point, all right, is that he's able to do that. So what makes him a world historical figure, and this is the point that we're eventually going to get to, is that Napoleon is the one that is taking the revolution, and the basis of the revolution, which was liberty, fraternity, equality. And he's taking those measures, and when he takes the army and starts to have interactions with the people around the world, he's taking that message with them. All right? It's what we call, what I call, Napoleonic code on the road. It makes sense. All right? Is that once liberty, equality, and fraternity are infecting the other areas of the, of the world, the German states, Russia, Hungary, Austria, Spain, wherever he is, those, those ideologies are sh coming out of France's borders, and eventually they're going to infiltrate everybody else's borders. And the message is good. Liberty, fraternity, equality is good. Napoleon is ultimately going to become very hypocritical. And the things that made him who he was, like, I came from nothing and I made something of myself, and I want to respect the idea that privilege is no longer, like, the thing that gets people to where they are. But then Napoleon, once he becomes an emperor, and once he becomes coordinated, uh, coronated, starts to act like a monarch. Starts to act like an emperor. Starts to carry around a scepter. Gets rid of his wife. He dumped his wife, uh, Josephine, and ends up marrying a Habsburg. He starts taking his brothers and his relatives and putting them into positions of power in other people's countries, which denies the idea of representative government. Okay? But they're all able to call him on that because he was the one that ultimately brought what was taking place in the French Revolution to everybody else. And once that happens, it's not going away. The whole 19th century, really, is Europe coming to reckon with the fact that liberty, fraternity, equality has now spilled out into everybody's borders. I mean, it's just a matter of time before they start trying to reorganize their, their uh, societies around liberty, fraternity, and equality. The fraternity part is a really important one. What is that? Fraternity just means like brotherhood. Nationalism is going to be the, the real pillar. Um, and that French nationalism, we got to see that. That was the levee en masse. But Napoleon and Napoleon's troops representing those ideals, when they go to the battlefield and they're facing people that have never seen that concept before, now they're sort of into that concept. German nationalism is built through a lot of its encounters with Napoleon in the very first century of the 1800s. Okay, and that's the stuff that's going to stick.